1956. Okay, so pass them round. Ooh. Oh my god. Okay, so pass them round a bit quicker, if we had all day. Would you be able to look at them? Not to leave you out at the end, be careful with these. Okay, hold these. Have a look at them and pass them around. Be very careful that this is glass. Okay, so make sure it doesn't fall on the floor. Paris from here. No. Where am I going to stop walking? There. 
Huh? Like, like, they're like the, um... It's 250 miles southeast of Marrakech. What's that? Marrakech is in North Africa. If I go from here to 250 miles southeast of Marrakech, I have a gigabyte of data on this stuff, and it weighs 3.8 tons. The Earth is 14.8 gigabytes in circumference of this stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay. So when we talk about, oh, I don't have enough space on my mobile, just think of those people back in the past. Right, let's grab this thing. Now, this thing here is... It's a typewriter. How do I cut and paste with a typewriter? Yes, you can. Scissors and glue. Oh, in olden times, did they have glue? Um, yes. So, a typewriter. What's this thing, then? A ruler. It is a ruler, but it's a special kind of ruler. This is called a slide roll. It's a calculating device. Now, this would allow you to do various scientific calculations. I'm sure there are people in the audience who have to use them in the class. Okay, let's grab these two items. Now, do you all know what this is? Record. It's a vinyl disc. This is an old way of storing music. Not the best, I might add. What's this one? It is a floppy disk. Now, where are the others? Ah, here we are. Now, we're going to play the numbers game again. 1972, 73. Everyone, everyone. 1972 and 73. How much data could I store on this thing? What? 72 kilobytes. By 1980, you could store a megabyte on it. Okay, we can stop passing the devices around now. That means don't pass it any further. Okay, so 1980, this is a megabyte. In 1980, this only holds 100k. But it goes up to 1.2 megabytes by 1984. So the question is now, how much data storage am I going to get on this thing? It's smaller. It's just over a megabyte, one and a half megabytes. This one, smaller still. Much is less. It's 512k. But what about this one? It's the same shape as that other one. How much data storage? 128 megabytes. So let's start getting some of these other things back. Okay. Let's take this, take this, right, that, and that. Right, now, this is rather entertaining. How much data storage on this? This is a memory device from 1956. What? 128 megabytes. On this, you're going to store 64 letters or numbers. This is Okay. You all know what this is? A tape, yeah. This used to be what we'd record music on. But in the computing industry, we also use it for computing. What is this? Anyone? It is. It's another computer. Who's heard of something as stupid as that, with a computer inside of a computer? Me. You do it all the time, when you go home to your PCs and stuff. What's this? It's not a spark plug, no. Who plays the guitar and has a guitar amp? Anyone? These live in your guitar amp nowadays. These are called valves. Now, the question that comes out of this little conversation is, what does this become later on? Does anyone have an idea? Let's see if I can find it. Where's the little three-legged pin device? There's another one with this. Did it disappear on the floor? Ah, oh, yes, there it is. Thank you. Ah. Okay, 1904, we invent this thing. This thing is very important. It becomes what first generation computers are made of. 1947, this thing gets invented. No, this is called a transistor. I'm going to ask a question. How many of these transistors are there? in one of these little memory keys here. A lot. A lot. That's Star Wars territory. A long time ago in the galaxy far, far away, they had a lot of transistors. How many of these in here? Like two. Two? Um, okay, 
Let the horse training begin. Millions. Okay, we millions. More than millions. Billions. More, billions. Yeah, billions. We're into billions. 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 Tens of billions. More than tens of billions. Oh, 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 a lot. Five hundred billion of these are in here. Yeah. Yes. Silly, isn't it? But you could think we could get so much. Now, mobile phone. There's one. Where's the large one, mobile phone? Well, like the really old fashioned one. Yeah. Then, yes, black this one. That Thank you. Really now, this mobile phone here, how much was this going to cost in 1983 when it was released? Probably like, probably like 100 pounds. pounds. It's about four and a half thousand pounds. This is how you're going to make a call. You're going to talk to people by holding this. But you have to make sure this is at least 30 centimetres away from you to make a good call. Look what it becomes. And then finally, look what it becomes when we say, enough with the buttons. Oh yeah. Still a button. Only one. Right, let's get this one back. And then this as well. <laughs> yes, it's painful, isn't it? Let's get the handle. Got it! February! Ah, no, that's not a telescope. This is a camera, yes. Now, the idea back in 1950s, you'd buy this, you'd be able to put film in it in the back, you'd lift this off here, and you could put the film in, and then you could develop the film. How many photos can I take before I have to change the film? Uh, 10. 20. Then you change the film. Now the idea is you pull this lever up and it keeps and it takes a picture. And then you wind this on and that then means you've wound on the film. Do you reckon I've oh, taken wow. any pictures? Because I kept pushing that. No, because there's no film in it. Oh, <laughs> Lucky really, isn't it? Now this item. Right, do we have any other bits floating around? Anyone right, you got anything more? What is this? It's a, 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 an abacus. It is, but what's it called? An abacus. Yes. When did it first come out? Ages ago. Give us a number. Yes. No. It was in 20,000 BC. Funny you should mention that. We had a thing called the Ashango mode in 20,000 BC, which was a form of calculating aid. Now this arrives in 2,700 BC. This is a calculator called the abacus that the Sumerians came up with. This is a calculator that starts life as a technology in 1642, mechanical calculators. And look what happens to the camera nowadays. It gets bigger and we turn it into a digital camera with loads and loads and loads of capability. So, on with the show. That's me. See, slightly older, slightly greyer than I was in that picture. Um, what I do, I'm an educational guide at the National Museum of Computing. I'm an artist. I do science fiction writing, photography. I draw and do musical things. And I'm generally a great person. But I promote that. And this is what I believe in, and it's what you should start thinking about. If you follow your heart and brain figure it out, what it means is that you're going to find a passionate career. Nothing's as simple as it at first seems, and as complex as we would like to believe it is. And finally, everything exists for a reason. So, before we start about how computing technology evolves, I want to ask you these questions. If you think these comments made by people in the future are correct. Thomas Watson Jr. said, or Thomas Watson Sr. said, that I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. True. True? Yeah. How many computers do you have at home? None. Yeah. How many though? Do you have a phone? Yeah. Yes, it's a computer. Do you have a game console? Smart TV? Yeah. Square or computers. What about the remote control for your TVs? That's a computer. And the keyboard and the mouse for your desktop. And the desktop and the laptops and the tablets and the washing machine and the microwave. And the Wi-Fi router and the central heating oh, system. You've got masses. Even the car your parents drive has got about 20 CPUs in it. So there's 20 computers in the car. Which really makes you wonder if your phone has about 10 to 20 CPUs in it. All of you have more computers in your phone than we had in 1950 in the world. Whoa. Scary prospects. So the next stage is computers in the future may weigh no more than one and a half tons. Oh. It's actually quite true in some cases, there are very big computer installations, but your phone doesn't weigh one and a half tons. 
And we will never have enough problems to work for one or two computers to work on. False. It is false because nowadays we have thousands of things working on one problem. I can assure you that data processing is bad that won't last. That's more for old people, really. True. Um, no, that was false. in 1957. They made these comments. Now they're correct at the time. Now computers are made of microchips, aren't they? Yeah. So why would an IBM engineer, IBM being a very big company, in 1969 or 68, say, what are they good for? False. That was false. There is no reason anyone in the right state of mind would want a computer in their home. False. It was a statement made about having a smart home. Who wants a smart home? It will lock you out if it doesn't like you. 640k is enough for anyone. And by the way, what is a network? False. It's a Bill Gates, <laughs> the man in charge of Microsoft. Now these statements were made in time by people who thought they knew everything about the computing industry at that time. Today we look at these and they're actually quite funny. So I'd like you to stop thinking about products, and I'll give you an example. Somebody said design a better phone. So they took this, and they designed this. And then they said make a better phone, and they said, did this. Do you see the similarity between these two items? One's bigger. Yeah. One's bigger, but it has the same fundamental principle. If you were to think about an idea and change it from, let's think, stop thinking about a mobile phone, and move it to a communication device, this will do. <laughs> I made them in play school. <laughs> yeah. And the idea behind it is that you can all talk on this. The problem, of course, is that after we get fast, as long as it doesn't get all tangled up. So you've all used these, have you? Yeah. 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 I thought I I like it. Now, really, what you're supposed to do is if I can get it untangled, which I might do later on, is you pull the string really tight. One person shouts into the cup at one end, and the other person sticks it to their ear, and they can hear. The strange thing is, you don't even need it because you can just shout at the person anyway. What it's trying to do is show transmission of sound through a very thin wire. So stop thinking about a product, i.e. a phone, and start thinking about the <coughs> ideas that make those phones. Now, ideas are responsible for these products. Have you thought about the drink on your desk? Somebody had an idea and they want to put it in a clear plastic bottle. Who came up with a plastic bottle? Um, Other people, yes. Other people. So those ideas allow you to make products. So it's cost and drink, though. So let's look at some foundation technology. This is called the Ashango bone. Nobody's entirely sure how it works, but what we do have is some idea that it may have been to do with groupings. Now this is 20,000 BC. 2010, yeah, that is. That's not before Christ. Unlike yeah. people who say, oh, the 1960s, those were olden days. <laughs> Now moving on, we've got the Sumerian abacus, that thing over there with the blue, the uh, green and the red beads. Well, that's an abacus. It is. This is the Chinese one that came out of around 190 AD. Now about 1800 years ago, the Chinese had a, an abacus. We only have vague references to it, but by about 1500, they have designed this kind of thing, and they've been using it for a long time. Now the reason he's in here is because you see all these books we have. In the 14th century, how many books do you think were printed? One. Um, seven. Not a lot. Not a lot. They didn't print them. They actually had to hand make books and yeah. draw them and write and all that. It was a very expensive thing. If you owned a book, you were wealthy. If you looked around your room at how many books you've got, you may have lots, you may have none because they're all digital now. So this man does something to the world that he didn't expect. It's this. In the 15th century, you had about 10 million books published. In the 16th century, you've got 210 million books, 210 million books. And this figure climbs. By the 18th century, we have almost a billion books being published a year in just Europe alone. What century are we in now? Well, we're in the 21st century now. So this figure went off the chart on the big screen. What it shows is that one idea opened up the market, and in turn, what do you learn from at school? Instead of the teacher, what do they give you to learn from? Books. Books. They give you ideas, see? Dangerous things, ideas. Now, in the 17th century, these three people make a big difference. This man on the end here is responsible for this thing. The slide rule, yes. He comes up with the concept that allows you to slide one scale against another. Then we have the mechanical calculator. <coughs> See that thing there? That black object there, that calculator? He invents that in 1642 at the age of 19. And finally, you have this man, got the, this uh, 
Gottfried Leibniz, he designs the idea behind binary. What's at the heart of all computer systems today? Ones and zeros. Binary numbers, yes. So those three people in the 17th century have no clue what they've invented. And then we look in the 19th century, and here's an interesting person right here in the middle. Ever heard of her? Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace. Keep her in mind, because she has an idea that if we can turn these two items into general purpose devices, it means you now have a computer, and she thought about that in about 1843. Well, she had the idea of, of if we can make this device do more than just calculate numbers, it might be able to do poetry, write music, books. So these people all create something that in the 19th century forms what we get today. Because when we move to the 20th century, fun things happen. You've got that thing, the glass valve, then the transistor, then this integrated circuit, then the CPU, and then the system on a chip. These are commented names for items. And they show you these dividing points. Now, who can tell me what a generation <coughs> is? Oh, that's what you meant. Yes, they are defined by something. Well, the first generation of computing starts with that, the vowel. Oh, that's a hoover. A hoover? Not quite. It's a vacuum. It's a vacuum. That's the thing that used to go in your computer, this thing here. Now, does anyone have a guess how big? Who's got an iPhone 6? Mm. How big would your iPhone 6 be if you had these in it? It wouldn't be much bigger, would it? Yeah. How much memory have you got in your iPhone 6? I've got like, not, do you know like, uh, not the first one, not the, like, the least one, but the second least one. What, the 32 gigabyte one? That one, yeah. Your iPhone 6 would be the size of London that in it. So that's the problem. This iPhone 6 would use so oh, much like electricity, electricity, you'd actually have to move to London to make phone calls. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? There's a computer built using things like this. As you can see, it's not small, is it? No, it's really massive. It's taller than that now. 1946, the world sees this. What they don't see are the women who programmed it. Now this is how you program this computer. Have <coughs> any of you done Python programming? No. Yeah. These are wires. You plug the wires in at a certain order, and all of a sudden, you are able to program this computer up. Now the important thing to know now is that the women program the solution that everyone crowed about being the first computer program. It's a programmable thing. So I'm going to ask, because I've never really asked this question, how does it make you feel that the first people who programmed a computer were actually women? Do you think it's wrong that they weren't praised? Yes. What would you do to prevent that from happening again? Sorry, it's, right, it's not a spectator sport. You can participate if you wish. Here is a man replacing a component in a computer that's made of lots of these. Nowadays you just take a chip out of your computer and replace that. Then you have to take out a large rack weighing about four kilos, change it, put another one in, and then you can get the computer working again. How long do you think the computer of this age would run for without needing somebody to repair it? Um, what, like nowadays? Like it's about eight hours. And they cook it up to about four days, solid at work, with no intervention. <coughs> Would you still be using your phone if you had to keep taking it back to, let's say, Apple every week? No, no. Why not? It's annoying. Yeah? Apple They do put their reputation on the line, don't they, when they say it will work for life? Yeah. Now, second generation computing. This thing here is called a trans... That's why they're alike. They're very similar and they are exactly the same in what they do. And this thing ushers in something totally different. It ushers in these. This circuit board here. Now, pass that around next to you just for a couple of minutes. So that circuit board has got lots of these on it. No, similar to that kind of thing. 
What do you think that plugged into? Do you think that's the whole computer? No. Mm. Yeah. yeah. No, that plugs into that. That's the desktop computer. This is a personal computer, by the way. What's missing? The screen and the screen. keyboard. It actually has a screen and a keyboard. Just down here where you can't see easily, there are buttons that you can slide back and forth. And on here, you've got these lights, these LEDs. They're your screen. What else is missing? Oh, is this like the olden days? Here we go, olden days. <laughs> this is 1965. Huh? It probably has a fan on the back, it's quite noisy. Yes. 18000 500 dollars for that machine. Who would actually buy that though? Scientists, businesses that wanted to work out calculations that require a constant thing. How many of you do your maths and find certain calculations boring because you have to keep doing them again and again and again? It's called iteration. Keep doing the same thing again and again, and uh, like insanity, expecting a different result. This computer here would take a lot of the drudgery out of maths and calculations, and if you put on certain other systems that allow you to store information, you could use it for payroll and stock control and other exciting things. Now, these are two women who worked primarily in the first generation era, but made their names in the second generation of computing. Now, the second generation of computing is using these. We're currently seeing that board go around as part of the generation that these women became famous for. But this woman on the left here, Dina St. Johnston, the reason we got her there is because people said she didn't write software, she tested it. Well, she did write it, but then she tested her program for efficiency, not actual bugs. And this woman on the right, became a rear admiral in the US Navy. She, Grace Hopper, came up with this concept of a programming language called COBOL, which was used heavily in the business community. So these two people, have you ever heard of them? No. You have now. Grasshopper. <laughs> no, not Grasshopper. <laughs> she was a fearsome woman who used to walk around with a one meter piece of wire, so that she could say, this is a nanosecond. <laughs> okay, the next generation of computing. So, huh? Okay, we got that thing still floating around here? Yeah. Let's just quickly grab this from moving. Okay, see? What do you reckon? It's not actually, it's part of the computer. It's part of a single circuit that does one job. But it helps games Well, that's funny enough is what happened to some of the first time sharing systems. They got turned into games machines. I wonder why. This is a very important invention. Now, here goes. See this thing? It's a mini board that's like this, and eventually, what does it get turned into? That. There, see that. You're right, it's operative. How big do you think that is? Massive. Tiny! <laughs> this was made by hand, okay? So the person who made this was doing it to prove that you don't need to keep making these circuit boards. Okay? We need a better system than this, because this, if I need 500 of these, I've got to order 500 of them, and they've got to be made, and that's called the tyranny of the place. That becomes that in 1961. This thing is a tiny, tiny, tiny thing about that big. It's got about five or six of those transistors on it. How much is it? How much is it? How much is it? It's about the weight of this. Lightweight. Now, that's what it becomes. And then you put them all into there. And so you end up with part of the computer. And then you put it in there. Now this woman, named Stephanie Shirley. Okay, now, who here has heard of the problem women have getting into anything that's of a high, high position? You heard of that? Parents talk about it? 
It's true. Back in the 60s, it was far worse. This lady here decided that she wanted to start up her own business because she was bored doing things for other people. So she did start up her own business and in doing so, earned an enormous quantity of money. But she changed a lot of perspectives because she had a company in the 60s that would only hire women. Do you think that's a fair deal? No. I do. Men don't have a problem getting a job in computing. Women do, so why not start? But they got done by the, the equality laws in 1975, so they had to start hiring men. But, look at one of the problems they worked on. Do you know what a black box is? A black box. If the plane goes down, it's the thing that's recording everything that happens so that you can make a picture of what it is. Her company programmed the solution for that black box to fit into this plane, which no longer flies. Concord. So you can see how one person who started their job in 1966 as a company on just six pounds, and then by the, when they went, uh, I think it was 2002, they became public, they made 70 millionaires out of the employees. This is your generation. That fits there. And you know that previous circuit board, this thing? If this is covered in chips, I need lots of these to make just this one board. There, I have just one board. Look what it's done. Let's turn it into a computer. So that's a 1975 computer. So I'm going to ask a question. What computer have you got at home that you use to play games on? HP, what? PC. Who knows what they've got at home? I've got a phone. You've got a phone. Play games on it. Well, if you bought this thing, you'd have to write your own software. Because there was none for it when it first released. So, what do you think is going to happen next? Huh? Ah, no, what's going to happen next is this. Somebody's going to make a digital watch in 1974, and by doing this, they turned everything you saw all onto one little black chip. <coughs> okay, now, here, this is a big timeline. Anything you, anything you recognize on here? Penguins. <laughs> This is 1975, that's when that machine you've just seen comes out. This is 1995, everyone has a computer. In 1975, you'd be lucky if you had a computer and you would be the only person on your street with a computer. Now you know what would happen in 1975? They'd knock on your door and say, can I have a look at your computer please? What would you do today if somebody wanted to knock on your door and see your computer? You'd slam the door, yeah, you'd run away in front of the police if somebody wants to see my computer. Next they want to take you away and show you their spaceship or something. Okay? Yeah, that's the problem. Now, this is where it gets really weird. See this thing here? That's the whole computer. How boring. It's got a system on a chip. Now, I want you to think of the most outlandish technology you can. Outlandish, most bizarre, most. What kind of technology do you want to see next? They already exist. You just have to have the money to buy them. They're large, large tuck tables, and you can draw on them with your fingers, or you can pick up pens and stuff. And the idea is that your countertop in the kitchen will be where you put your phone, and all the photos spill out. And then you say, "That one, send it to this person." Holographic. Well, we're going to go one stage further than holographic. Yes. Why? You just have to make a transparent battery and a transparent cell, and the best bit is you can't see the phone. How about that? You can call for it and it'll actually talk to you. This is a technology that actually exists now. This is not make believe, it actually exists. Now, the beauty of this kind of thing is I can make this screen a heads up display in your car. 
Ah, uh, it's a prototype. It doesn't exist at the moment. How about this one? Contact lenses instead of virtual reality. Well, you can get the massive like, thing to go to your eyes. Tell me. Tell me this sounds like fun. Of course it does. Think about this. You're out with all your friends. You're in a field somewhere. And you're going to say, hey, which film do you want to watch? And they go, oh, I don't know. And you go, right. And there's four films drop down by your arm like flax. And then they say, what about that one? You say, I don't know. Expand now. No, don't like that. Screw it up. Throw it away. This one? Yeah, let's watch that one. Screw it up and throw it down the end of the field like a ball. It hits the end of the field and draws a 600-foot cinema screen that you all sit back and watch. The technology is on the verge of existing. They've got prototypes of what's called augmented reality contact lenses. These allow you to see information overlaid like a holographic display in front of your eyes. Who knows? I have no idea. Well, I could do a Dr. Evil, couldn't I? My now, that is nothing compared to this. How about cloaking technology? What's that? You can see through the car. You can see through him and him and him. That's cool. What you do is you cover your jacket in little tiny cameras, pin, pin, little tiny pinhole cameras. They take pictures on one side and they project it to illuminated platforms on the other. So you can walk through a crowd. Now, this is very, very fringe technology. The question is, why do you need to hide to this degree? Unless you're a celebrity, of course, or somebody who needs to get from A to B and C. But the idea is that you can have people who are now billboards. Your clothes can have <laughs> shimmering patterns. You don't like the texture on your clothes? Fine. Load up another one. You see it on the line, you sort your phone, you put your phone against your jacket, the jacket learns the texture, and then the jacket now has a new texture. You up for that? How much stuff you see? How about this? This stuff's called aerogel, it's bizarre. You can actually put this stuff over a flame and not feel the heat. Think about the stuff, you wear a pair of clothes like this, you walk into an area that's got flames, so firemen never get burned. Now you're thinking. So this is science, technology, engineering, maths, all the play here, but it starts because we have better computers to design this stuff. Now this is the really weird one. See this thing, this N here? Any of you remember a one penny piece? Yeah. The N in the one penny piece is the size of that computer. Wait, what N? See this one here, look. N. That computer is actually smaller than the letter N on the one penny piece. This is 2011, by the way. That's six years ago. What do you think they've got today? It's so small you can't even see it. They're down to 0 0.05 millimeters in size. Now, ready for this one? Let's make it tiny and put it on a bumblebee. Oh. Oh, I'm not kidding. Hitachi have, <laughs> Hitachi have just released a brand new, what's called an ARFID tag that has a processor in it, some memory, and it's able to transmit a signal to passing sensors. So the idea is you put this aerial with the chip underneath it and glue it to a bee, the bee flies around, and now you can find the bumblebee and how it moves through the air. And you can find out how they are interacting with their environment. The biggest problem with a bumblebee is it flies off in the distance and you can either run after it or you can track it. Or you can get stuck, yeah. So you just stay at a safe distance. So this is your future, this is your future, and it's for you to think of those new ideas that make this a possibility. Okay? Now, I always like to find these games, they're always entertaining. It's how fast is your computer against the past? This is the number, this is pi, it's a symbol used to denote a number, and it's a Greek symbol, we have a variety of uses for it. But certain mathematicians like to chase this sequence of numbers. You can keep going past here, okay? Have you all seen pi? Yes. I'm not talking about the one with meat in it. Yeah. Good. Now, it's the equivalent of climbing Mount Everest in computing terms. All you do is you say, right, more and more calculations, find out when this number ends or doesn't. Pi don't end, does it? We don't know we've not got there yet. This is like infinity. How do you know it's infinity? Have you actually got to the end yet? No. How do you discover The Greeks. Brainy bunch. They, they came up with the concept that they were doing circumferences and circles. And they needed some way to describe this. So they put a symbol and behind it it's quite a bit of maths. But in 1873, this guy here, William Shanks, goes and calculates pi over two years. This is human calculation. That many digits of pi. He should have stopped about here because he was wrong from then on in, but hey, that's not the point. He still went ahead and calculated two years of his life. Now, 
In 0.1 seconds, how many digits of pi can I calculate on an average computer today? Loads. Loads. Like that many. What, in one second? 0.1 second. What's Tenth of a second. You calculate 100,000 places of pi. See, that's the 707 positions, and that's 100,000. Yeah, so pretty much so. Like this is two years. This is my modern computer in 0.1 seconds. So the question is, what are you going to do with all this computing power? Are you going to keep playing games, sending text messages? Are you going to break, it? Are you going to break some rules and make something new? Yeah, break some rules. The rules were meant to be broken, not completely destroyed. You meant to bend them to the wall. Anyway, that's a slight. Okay, if that's not enough, get this. We got a computer at Bletchley Park. It's the oldest computer, but still original. It's the witch. There it is, in all its glory. This thing. 1951 they finished this. In April 1951 they ran their first program, and they used it till 1956. Now I use this on a regular basis as one of the education guides, and I must say, it's a privilege for me to actually use it. Because it's 66 years old, yes. Uh, well, no, it's kind of an accident. You see, you've got one down here that's looking down, and then you've got another one here that's kind of got all his teeth showing. These are teeth, by the way, because if I touch those, I'll electrocute myself. They're all open fuses. Ah, the last time I touched a 13 amp socket, I suffered a headache, but I didn't die. And if I have died, I don't know it yet, and I'm actually still here. Just too stupid to know where to die. Now, all of this side is your memory. This bit here is the clock. This here is the accumulator, and that's called the arithmetic logic unit. You'll hear about these later, yes. Is our memory bigger than that? Is that holds 320 letters or numbers equivalent. In your computer at home, if you've got a desktop computer, it's probably got 8,000 million letters or numbers average. Which is more? Which is more? 320 or 8,000 million? Uh, the 8,000 million, I should think. Now, if I want to calculate, okay, it's got my nice picture here. This thing here, do you know what this is? An iPad. No, no, no. This thing here. It's called a Mandelbrot. It's a mathematically calculatable shell. Okay. If you get into maths in a big way, who likes maths? Excellent, I'm glad you said yes. Now, if you get into maths in a big way, this picture can be calculated. The thing is, there's another one of these, there's another one of these, you'll see lots of repeating shapes. It shows something called self-similarity in maths. That image, if I want to calculate it on the witch, the one you've just seen, that computer, how long would the witch have to run to calculate that picture? Well, my iPad's giving it about half a second. On the timeline. Anyone, yeah, get someone up here, come on. Someone at random. Come on. Yeah. You have to stand where you think this computer will finish its calculation if we started it trying to draw that thing there. That's the witch computer that I showed you a moment ago. I want you to stand in this timeline and put your finger down where you say, oh, I think it stops there. Just put your hand anywhere. If I built this computer sometime in the past and I want it to stop calculating and make that picture, where do I have to start building this computer? Start. When do I start? In the past. Do I start when Jesus was around? Do I start in the Bronze Age somewhere or somewhere between, or do I start maybe a hundred years? So where do you think that old 1951 computer? Doug Engelbart there, back in 1963, is looking for the best way to control a computer. And in 1968, he gives a demonstration of this technology that they've all been working hard at. And this guy from Xerox is there. He sees the demo and goes back to Xerox and is so impressed they start to build technology like it. 1983, Steve Jobs comes in the picture and sees this thing. Or oh, in 1979, sorry. And he's so impressed, but Steve Jobs goes away to Apple and starts designing something else. See, there's the graphic user interface, and there's the mouse they used. And that's what Steve Jobs' company, Apple, came up with first. Lisa. Lisa, yeah. Yes? When was Apple actually... When did it come about? Yeah. 1976. 
Yeah, it is rather. I was eight. <laughs> I remember that year. It was really hot. There were no clouds in the sky anywhere on the UK. It's really strange. Eventually, they made this thing here. Recognise the name? Macintosh. Macintosh. Yes, the Macintosh is still alive today, long after a lot of other machines have disappeared. But that's what it looked like back in 1984. Yeah. But you see it in this country as well. Now, Steve Jobs came back to Apple, but before that, he actually had to leave. It's usually the way, isn't it? And in 1988, his company produces a machine, and the next cube is connected to this man here on the right. You've heard of this guy here, Tim Berners-Lee? No, no, no. Oh, come on. Yeah, no. Surely you've heard of Tim Berners-Lee? No. No? Modern history is what it used to be. How about that, Bernard? Okay, this computer here is so revolutionary that this man, when he's working at CERN in Switzerland, starts using these, and they develop something that you all use today. Anyone have a guess of what it is? No? What's it all connected to? Yes, so we're dealing with internet technology. What kind of internet technology? HTML? Do you know what that is? No. It's how the web page is made up. So when you type www.google.com, lots of instructions are sent to your web browser, and it draws that picture on the screen. All the text flies in and it gets laid out. So it's a way of laying out all the graphics in the text on screen so that it looks pleasing. Have any of you looked at a web page with no formatting? You should, you should definitely try it. It looks really horrible. There's no structure. It's all over the place. It all collides. Well, this guy thought, wouldn't it be better if we could take all these different machines and they could talk a common language and they could display something on your page so that you don't have to care. You just type in something and up it all pops. Now, Tim Berners-Lee is responsible for changing the world. But without those other three people, it's debatable whether he would have had the chance to do that, because his ideas may still have been prototypes. See how the world's changed? <coughs> how many people are on the internet today? Loads. Exactly right this moment. Loads. Loads. Millions. Millions. It's estimated about half the population of the planet are within access of the internet. That's what I'm trying to do, I'm internet. Yeah, yeah, scary number, isn't it? When you think, three to four billion people with access to a common network. If you'd said this to people in 1950, don't worry, everyone would be able to talk on this internet. Do you think they'd have believed you? No. No, of course they wouldn't. So, and finally, this is an homage to a man called James Burke. I want you, when you go home tonight, with this slightly different perspective on technology and computing and all the other things around you. To look at all the things in your room. Don't do anything, just look at them. And go around the house and just look at these things in the house. And I want you to ask yourself, what do these things do for me and what do they achieve? I mean, in essence, what do they mean to you? Pick something, just pick something in your room. Pick something you like. Your bed. Your bed. So, Think of the technology as well. And then ask yourself, how can I make it better? How can I match my Oh no, it doesn't. Now we're starting to think of ideas. Why not that aerogel? In the, in the winter, that aerogel is going to be the perfect insulator, isn't it? In the summer, it's just going to be purgatory. <laughs> You'll have to get to go to a research. So, there you go. So the last, last thing I want to ask you is out of all this stuff on the table, I'm going to leave it here for the, for the duration. You can come down and look at it if you want and pick up anything. Obviously, you bar that, but pick up anything here. But this is the last thing to leave you with. See this calculator? Yeah. This came from Poundland. Oh, did you know? Okay, Poundland. See this calculator? 
How much do you think it costs? Uh, 15,000 pounds. Two hundred and fifty pounds in nineteen fifty-two. Let me reiterate this. Poundland. This has more functionality than that could ever dream of having. This one here. If I I have a button on here that's called log. If I type a number and press log. How quickly is it before I get my logarithmic value? Pretty much instantaneous. How long would it take me to calculate a logarithmic value on this thing? An hour. Take me about three hours. So you can imagine working all day, every day, for about a week, you're going to get a page of figures that you can calculate on this in about 20 minutes. And this only costs a pound. That's the, that's the lunacy of all this electronics. That calculator back in 1952 would have cost you several million pounds. Do you reckon we were able to get a phone in Pound Land in like 20 years? Uh, probably yes. That's so cool. They're called burner phones, I believe. Please hate them. Oh, they do something for you. So, does anyone have any questions? Now I've bombarded you with massive information. Yes. Actually, must I be a. That's the, always the paradox, isn't it? How do you square that one? Effectively, if you took them back, you probably wouldn't last long. There isn't a government on the planet that wouldn't kill to get this technology in the 50s. Why? Because it opens up lots of other doors. But let's say, hypothetically, you took it back, you made billions of them and everyone had one. Would they learn how this worked or would they take this for granted and continue to use it? I guarantee people would learn how it worked. How those changes happen and what it does is a difficult game to play because we can never tell exactly how this technology will change things if you go back to the Germans, for instance, in World War II. Give them the ability to calculate faster. Maybe they'd have been more dangerous. So we don't want them any more dangerous than they were. So, thank you very much. If there are no further questions.